Barney, how excited are you not to have to gin up Leafs topics in the dead of summer? Because yeah. we're trying. We did just work ourselves into a, a slight lather about Sheldon Keefe, which that just proves we're sick. I don't think that proves anything other than that. But, yeah, how excited are you to just get to, you know, relax a little bit in summer vacation? Well-deserved, yeah, by the way. You- Thank you. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, like there is still a lot to be decided with the Leafs and what their team is going to look like. And like, I, I think there is still drama to pick through, but like to just step back from it for a minute mm-hmm. is really, really nice. Uh, <laughs> Sam can attest and obviously Gunner, you two in a you know di- different time slot, the daily immersion in the drama when sometimes there's not that much drama, you just need to let time pass and let things play out. It is nice to have a moment. Now, that said, I am really excited about this year ahead and given this you know, different look and all that. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty pumped to have a little break from it all. Before we get back into hockey, Barney, do you think the hole-in-one buying everybody a drink tradition is stupid? You know what? I got to tell you, I was, so I have one hole in one. I was 12 years old. Okay, I, well, that, then, it from, you can't buy a drink for everyone, then you're safe. Chocolate milks for all the <laughs> fellas. <laughs> but I I was, uh, you know, playing the forward tees, 12 years old, hole in one, and I got in and they were like, oh, you got to buy everyone drinks. And I thought I was going to be fetid with gifts and prizes. <laughs> and I was expected to buy an iced tea for anyone. Blew my mind. I think it's ridiculous. Oh, okay. Because we've been argue, we've been arguing a little bit about it this morning. I I don't think it's the best tradition, but it's a tradition nonetheless. That one you have because I was uh, I played yesterday and a guy in front of me got a hole in one. So yeah, um, but he didn't handle That's it right. Awesome. He didn't go into the clubhouse. He didn't tell any. Like he was just sitting in the parking lot on his phone, and it just got me thinking. Like you got to buy a drink yeah. at least for us, the group behind. Like I saw it so, happen. You got to buy a drink for somebody. I now that I Bad am golf karma. forty years old, I absolutely support the buying of the drink thing like i thought it was ridiculous th- then but like i would do it now and you've just had this wonderful moment you're going to tell people about forever i think it's cool to get everyone in to celebrate it a little it kind of sucks you got to foot the bill but really the course should pay the course should support that sort well, of thing i played with a guy who told me his home course has the Hold ace, one insurance the yeah. ace insurance where you pay like I, f- I forget what it is at the start of the year and if you get one you they pay for the the rounds which i mean if you're playing on like a men's night it's going to save you yeah, a significant could be a couple amount yes yeah, yeah anyways that's all i just want to get your take on that Borny. <laughs> Well, it's, it is a fascinating concept, but because it is one of those like traditions, it's like, I would abide by it today, but yes. When I, I would younger, kill I to drinks. spend $200 on drinks for people. <laughs> I, know, I right? would do anything for that, so there you go. I stuffed when I played D'Antonio. My son played his first round of golf oh, ever. We nice. played nine holes nice. a week or two ago. Uh, complete dirt tee boxes that day. <laughs> D'Antonio had just punched, <laughs> scraped, and raked the tee boxes. But I stuffed one. I mean, like, inches on whatever. Ooh, the hole's like 60 yards. Nightmare. Would I count a 60-yard no, no. dirt tee box wedge not. ace? That's a pitch. That's not a – That's not a. That's, you can't. I feel like if it's a hole in one What's course. What's the yardage then? Well, everyone's like, oh, the par three course doesn't count. It doesn't. It does count. No. It just has to be a legit length. Like, it has to be over 110 for me, unless it's on like a normal mm-hmm. course. Mm-hmm. 90. On, over 90. If it's on a normal course, like, for example, our Gunning and I's beloved Lakeview, there's a hole on it that's like 85 yards, yep. and it's my number one choice in the world to get a hole in one on. Like, that's the number one hole I want a hole in one on. Sam Sneed. And. Why? It's it's just beautiful. Borny, it's picturesque. If you, Borny, if you ever played Lakeview with me, you'd understand. Okay? okay? One of these times this summer, you're going to get out and play with me. And it's just, if you're playing it within the context of a round, and it's a short one, but if you're playing a hole in, a, a par, a par three course, you get a hole in one on like a 65-yarder, that does not count, unfortunately. Yeah. So good thing I'm, I didn't I'm have with you there. I, I honestly was like, don't go, don't go. Like, I don't want that one. I don't want no. to have to, like... I have one from the forward tees at 12 and one at D'Antonio. Like, like I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, that would yeah. be tough. That would be tough. Although, quite the Superman move as dad. Like, would you ever feel more powerful oh, than true. just ace in front of the kid? Like, what can't you do? Oh, my See, God. See, Chucky, it's easy, I, bud. Just hit it in the hole. Yeah, why, why not? Just do it that way. I can only imagine. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that, I'm happy we got you to weigh in on that because uh, I have been way too preoccupied with this. I've been looking up the theories as to where this possibly started. The two we've seen that we like are uh, just to keep people honest. Somebody said you got to do it as a way to stop people from going, oh, I got a hole in one. I like that. Uh, and then there was oh, another. Oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah, the idea like of just theory. like, we got to instill honor in this game early. And the only way to make people people honorable is to make them pay for it. Uh, so can yeah, I, I do Can like I just that. say that I don't, 
need all of the professional athletes tweeting that Steph Curry could be a pro golfer? Can they all stop? Do they have any context for no, what like elite thank golf you. is like? I'm I am so happy you brought this up. I got irrationally mad seeing all of that yesterday. How long would it take? Forever. Uh, I saw somebody, I think it was like Rob Gronkowski <laughs> threw it out, and Dylan Fratelli, you know, minor-ish PGA Tour guy, said, if you gave him five years of focusing on just golf, he could probably make a couple cuts on the Corn Ferry. And that is the <laughs> highest of praise he was willing to yeah. keep on Steph Curry. I'm with you. I lose my mind every year when we do this. I love, I love that Steph I Curry love loves Steph golf. Curry playing golf, but I Me agree. Too. That's absurd takes. Yeah, just, do you guys know how good those guys are on tour? Like, it's no just clue. a different world. Like, Ricky Fowler was in shambles. He was a mess for, like, years. <laughs> and he would be, and he, he would, just, he would nine and aim Stephen Curry. I want, you know what? I'm, <laughs> yes, 100%. I'm going at his worst. I'm going the other way on this. I want, I want more golfers just posting videos of themselves playing other sports. And I want people to be like, Gary Woodland would be a problem in the NBA or something like that. <laughs> just to see, just to see how the reaction would go. And you know what? I get, I bet people would not take that too well. I don't think people would like to hear Woodland. the John Rahm is going to be. Gary Woodland's a great I would, I would, as a random I, I would, PGA I would, he did. He played hoops in high yeah. school and college. Yeah. I would. Oh, did he? Okay. I would kill to see Gary Woodland. I'd pay a lot of money to see him play ten minutes in an NBA game. Oh, <laughs> so, get honestly, they have this celebrity game at the All Star game every year. Get, get our man, man Gary yeah. uh, cruising, cruising around. Well, and out they there. always, they always have the bet. Like you know, could you could you score two oh. points in an NBA no. game? No. You no. know, if you no. played forty eight minutes, no. it's like could I, Gary Woodland score two I, points? Well, he played college <laughs> ball. Let's I, see. I saw this meme the other day. It was like. For one million dollars, no, for ten million dollars, could you score fifteen points in an NBA game if you played all no, forty-eight minutes? Like fifteen points. Yeah, it's the, like Fred Van Vliet doesn't score twenty million dollars a year if I could do that. <laughs> he doesn't. Fred Van Vliet can't score fifteen some games. <laughs> the most yeah. insane version of that has been the one going around of Would you take a million dollars? Or the chance to get $10 million if you can get five yards in an NH NFL game as a running back? Uh, the answer to that is death. Most people are not surviving <laughs> to get that chance at $10 million. That is the, truly the most yeah. absurd one. Uh, five yards. you got to take a oh, shot. I think, I, think yeah. I, could complete one pass. I think I could complete one pass in shotgun formation behind the line of scrimmage before I die. I think rushing the ball. <laughs> but if you've got the Eagles O-line. You, no, you, you, no, you fall no, down. You, do not. you no. fall down four times. You might get a yard. Sportsnet content team, get this man. Forget the Eagles. Get him to York University and let him run behind that O line and have those boys break him. Tell me you wouldn't want to see that, Borny. Old Gumby out there in football pads. That. I'd be dead. Yeah. But it's I, I would pay the hole in one amount of money to watch <laughs> Mickey run behind York's O line. Oh God, I really do uh, want to see that. Uh, so uh, Leafs hockey? Yeah, we'll talk a little yeah. hockey here. So you mentioned there's still a lot to be decided. I think everything is in, you know, at least from the fan base perspective, a holding pattern until this Matthews deal gets got, gets done. I think Nylander is much more up in the air. I think even people who are the biggest of Nylander supporters can see a world where it doesn't make sense to give him exactly what he's asking for. Does it just feel like we're just kind of sitting here waiting for the Matthews domino to fall or is there, are there kind of other things you're, you're looking at here? Well, there seems to be like some sort of concerted effort to not have him be the first one, like to get Nylander under contract before the Matthews number is announced, presumably because the Matthews number is going to make Nylander want more money. But like, I just fail to see how any of these things are connected. Like there's six, 700 players in the NHL and you know, your counterparts, the people you're most like and going to be paid like are rarely on your own team. So I've hated for years the whole Leafs looking at each other's salary and saying, well, Tavares says this, so this is the new ceiling or this is the floor for me or, you know, I just, it doesn't make sense to me. So these guys look around the league, you know, find what you're roughly worth as a comp. Don't worry about if Matthews is making more or whatever and, and just get it done to me. So it's it's been weird to me that we're this far along and we don't have any sort of announcement on this. I, it seems like the Nylander one is really, they're really dug in on, but I am surprised we don't have a Matthews contract. Yeah. Like, I just kind of thought that I was going to be July 2nd or something. I completely agree that it's a little bit, I wouldn't say it's headed into the 
total concern, concern zone yet, Borny. A little but uncomfortable. I, I would say I'm a little bit uncomfortable by the fact that it hasn't gotten done. But I guess the one kipper theory was that they're waiting for you know, Nylander, like, like uh, Gunner said. Yeah. I just – do you think Nylander is signed or is on the team at the start of training camp? You know, the longer this goes on, the less likely I think it is. And, you know, you look at just the way that they went about free agency – you know, like Domi had some goals and Bertuzzi had some goals. Like, it's almost like they protected themselves against moving him. And I just can't look at their lineup and look or look at their decor and be like, that's good enough to win a Stanley Cup. Like, they need to do something there. So if he's going to be really expensive and they added some goals, it, it seems to me like there's a world where you could trade him for some help on defense and I know that's been the talk for with Nylander for as long as we've been he's been around literally his entire career yeah we'll trade Willie for a D but like the circumstances now I think make it more likely than at any other point in his tenure at the Leafs so uh yeah I'd say I'm 60 percent he's a Leaf next year 40 percent gone kind of kind of a weird way to phrase this but if you're gonna trade Nylander for a D, does that D have to be Morgan Riley's partner? I mean, I understand we've been looking for a partner for him forever. TJ Brody has worked well, but that also, you know, didn't look as good as it's looked in the past at the tail end of the playoffs last year, really, you know, the the entirety of the playoffs. Brody was kind of scuffling. You know, I could be talked into this mythical partner, could be a partner for Jake McCabe, and that frees Riley up to do other things. How do you look at what you're looking for in that defenseman if that's kind of the way they go about the trade uh, doesn't it feel like the guy you need for Morgan Riley is not I don't know Jacob Slavin the best defensive defenseman in the league like mm-hmm. uh, it seems to me like he's played his best hockey with Luke Shen yep Ron Hainsey honey you know yeah Labushkin Hanway. you know like he's been pretty good with some guys that are not the best players in the league. He just needs someone whose focus is defending, someone who does not care about accolades or you know points or whatever, someone who just wants to be a defender. So for Riley, I'm not sure that it has to be his partner, but I just would like someone that it's one nothing Leafs and there's two minutes left, someone I want to see come over the boards. Because right now, is the, if it, it's not Riley, right? That's not your number not one Klingberg? defensive choice. <laughs> Well, that's it. Is it Klingberg? Is it Lilligren? Is it, you know, go through the list. It's like Geo at his best, maybe, but what are we, what's he going to be next year? I just want someone I can trust, you know? Yeah, that's, that's how it How works. much do we, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm putting together the blue line, I have a big gap between Mark Giordano and everybody else, and not because I'm completely writing him off, but it's just we saw how it got towards the tail end of the season. Like, do you think they can go into the year with him as anything other than their seventh D? Do you think they can, you know, we have all the conversations about Tavares, and they got to spare him, and they got to move him off center. I feel a lot better about John Tavares playing center than I do Mark Giordano playing 82 games next year. You know, it's been really quiet around Mark Giordano, has it not? Like, have we heard a thing from him about next year? Literally not a peep. We haven't heard a thing from anyone, Borny. It's been the Sahara. That's fair. I know, it is. It's really strange. And, like, there was, you know, Kipper had talked about on our show that he wasn't even sure that Giordano was going to come back. And I kind of went into summer with that feeling, too. It just last year felt like it was a lot for him. And, God, he was pretty good for them in Game 70. But it did tail off, and by playoffs, it, it kind of got a little tough to watch there. So, yeah, I, I think he's got to enter the enter as a seven for sure, Gunner. But does he want to do that? You know, play, you know, make league minimum and be the seventh D. I guess the guy loves the game, so if he wants to be that role, you're happy to have it. But yeah, if you if you have but, him higher in the lineup than that, you're in trouble. Well, all all we ever heard from him is he's like, oh, you got to keep the engines red. Yeah. I can't. I got to play every right. night. It's like, ah, man, right. that's. Honestly, a big reason why I was concerned about bringing Keith back is maybe some of the relationships that he has with these guys in terms of like feeling a commitment to play them a certain amount of times. And like when that conversation was floating around that they were going to bring Alex Kerfoot back, it was like the nightmare because it's like <laughs> even if he signed for you said a at dollar, minimum you wouldn't have a no, dollar. If he signed for a dollar, he's still like the first option when they <laughs> when Willie and Tavares are scuffling. It's like Flex yeah, here we go back into the top <laughs> six for Kerfoot. I just I feel like some of the relationships that Keith has with these guys and where he plays them in the lineup is one of the reasons that it's surprising he's coming back. That it just feels like it's gonna be a lot of the same with some of these guys. 
But but don't you feel like Tree Living opens the door for Keith to tell all these guys in like a totally one on one meeting before the season things are different now? Like I think you yeah, think but you how can much have di- those how much different can it be if it's still the same guy? Well, I think like, I think did that's, he have the shackles on that. That's hard? the thing. I think this is the black box that the unknowable thing about the Leafs is just how much was Sheldon Keith coaching the way he wanted to versus the way he was asked to. And how much of that will change with a different GM? Like, does it does it not kind of feel like that's the whole question of what Keith is as Leafs coach going forward? Because I I mean, again, like it shouldn't be this big an issue or this big a fork in the road moment. But I would love to know whose idea it was to walk back the soft and purposeless. I'm sure it was not one person, but I would love to know who made that decision. And I think that the answer to that has a big impact on what version of him you get this year. So I don't think the Sheldon Keefe would coach a way that he didn't want to coach. Like, I, I don't think that anything would – the decisions have been his, in my opinion. Like, yes, there would be conversations with Kyle, and that sort of thing, Gunner, I think is separate. That's That to me isn't even coaching where they're like, hey, you can't talk about our star players like that or whatever Keefe, you know, Dubas would have said there. But uh, the way he's coached, I think, has been his own choices. However – I think the tree living thing gives him a chance to even reevaluate himself and the choices he's made and try to be different. So he can come back and maybe it'll even look like to people, oh, it was Dubas who had him doing X, Y, Z when he decides he wants to try some other things this year. But I think you'll see some different choices. And at the very least, it frees him up to say, Gio, you know, we want, you know, you wanted to keep your engine revved. We're not doing that this year. Here's why, you know, and just go through the whole lineup with your guys and say, in the past, we've done this. That's not going to be the case this year. It's a fresh start for a lot of guys. So I was all set to let you go, but I figured you're a good person to ask about this. We were putting together our fake Willie Nylander trades earlier this oh, week, God. and I was having such a trouble. It took a beating again for my trades. Holy God. Yeah. Oh, I was having oh, such God. a problem <laughs> with what Nylander's value is across the league because we had some different ones, but the one we did agree on now, McKee got crazy and just kept adding assets uh, onto the Leaf side of things for very minimal. So I don't know that it would happen, but a Keandre Miller, Willie Nylander trade, where do those two kind of fit on the NHL value scale? Like Nylander has clearly proven more, but you're about to have to pay him. Keandre Miller has more upside. It may be a more premium position, but he's also proven less in the league. And I don't want to make it just about those two, but when I'm trying to put together a Nylander trade, I have just such a hard time kind of ranking where he is as a, as an asset in the NHL. Well, what makes the conversation so hard is that you have to assign him a dollar amount before you can trade him. Like, no one is trading for Willie, I don't think, without knowing that there's an extension in place or a dollar amount that he will sign for. So, Willie Nylander, if he signs for $9 million, I think has real value. But if he wants ten and a half, I don't think there's anyone who's going to give you too much for him. So mm. if you say, okay, pick the sort of the middle number, what Willie might get, uh, eight years at nine and a half million or something like that, you know, w- would I trade him straight up for Keandre Miller, who just signed a deal for two years and what four million? Yeah, a just under or four. Yeah, just under four. Probably. You know, like you need a D-man, and he's big, and he skates, and he's young, and has yeah. upside. Like you know, it, you could probably talk me into that just because it's not just the player it's the position you mentioned the premium the age but also then you're freed up to spend the other five and a half to make your team better that you were going to give to willie anyway so now we just got to get the rangers to do it my my trade also involved nick robertson and uh alex lafreniere and uh, barkley goudreau and it was a and kyle (laughs) yarncroft it was it was a blockbuster video pal and i took a beating for it it was the slowest (laughs) news day of the year it was like literally just like oh this will be fun and it was like, no, you see idiot. Here's here's <laughs> here's the much more reasonable one I threw out was uh, Nylander for just Goudreau and Miller, which I feel like is still a big uh, big ass there. But yeah, McKee uh, attacking on all the least problems and all the Rangers fun upside pieces. I did love it, uh, but yeah, he got <laughs> banned. L- L- Lafreniere, I would really love. Would- I feel like you know. Buy low in this guy. I think I still think he's going to be a decent player. Yeah, I agree. There's no way the guy who looked like that just a couple of years ago and has had some moments, albeit not recently, but some playoff moments for that team, I would be all over jumping on that. But I imagine a lot of teams are uh, are thinking the same. Uh, Borny, loved you jumping on with us. And uh, Thanks, brother. thrilled for you getting out of Dentonia in the mud pit there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. There he goes. Justin Bourne. Back to summer vacay. 